Justice League is a horrible, incongruous mess. I mean, it's literally the mishmash of two directors with really conflicting styles. However, that cloud, it had a silver lining. Or maybe a gray one, depending on who you ask. What did Justice League do? It brought fans together, demanding one and the same thing. To be fair, we had wanted it because we actually wanted to see it, or we wanted it because we wanted to make fun of it. For the record, I actually wanted it, and consider myself a fan of Zack Snyder's work. However, you might call me a bit of a hypercritical fan. I might dissect and dislike more of his movies than I like, but I always watch them and return to them, and I talk about them almost as much as I talk about a Stanley Kubrick movie. I believe that says something about Mr. Snyder's work. That's, to me, a great compliment. I'm genuinely comparing him to Stanley Kubrick because both of their films are films that make you want to watch them and dissect them. Now, Stanley Kubrick is his own kind of film genius, but that's a compliment to Mr. Snyder, for sure. But as we know, Zack Snyder tends to be a polarizing filmmaker. His fans will support him no matter what, and sometimes his critics criticize him no matter what. However, a combination of personal tragedy and or studio musical chairs resulted in a film that had his name on it but wasn't really his. We all came together and said in one voice, bring us the Snyder Cut. Again, I have personally had not negative, but sometimes unfavorable opinions about Mr. Snyder's work. On my old podcast, we covered Dawn of the Dead, Sucker Punch, the aforementioned Snyder Cut, and I probably had more unkind things to say than kind things about those films. However, again, I think Zack Snyder is a singularly driven, singularly focused, unique filmmaker capable of true brilliance. Some would argue he achieved it with 300. It's a beautiful and brutal movie. It's raw and visceral and not deep in a simple sense. And I don't mean that as an insult. It's simple in a good way. He achieved something special with that film. 300 is a story of a battle they can't win. So maybe it's at least a little deep and frankly, it might be brilliant. Now let's talk about Thanos for a second. Yeah, I know. Thanos was created by Jim Starlin in 1973, making his first appearance in Iron Man. Darkseid came three years earlier during Jack Kirby's run at DC. He was the big bad in the epic New God story, probably Jack's best story outside of his collaboration with Stan Lee. He first appeared in Superman's pal Jimmy Olsen of all comics, which I used to have, but unfortunately I sold when we were saving up to buy our house. Kirby chose to work on that book because it was their lowest selling title. From what I understand, he took that book, not just for that reason, but because it was an open book, it had no creative staff. Kirby came up in the depression and didn't want to take work from someone else. And this book had no creative team, so there you go. While I'm sure that story is true, I have a feeling that he also thought, hey, this book isn't selling well. I can really play around with things here and kind of do what I want to. To paraphrase Jim Croce, you don't tug on Superman's cape or redraw his face, but do whatever the heck you want with Superman's sidekick. Dad, don't sing. <laughs> Anyway, his first real appearance was in the Forever People, which is just such a glorious name. Forever people, forever, forever people, forever, forever people, forever people. Stop it, Daddy. Jack Kirby could be a little bit hit or miss when naming his own characters in books. For the most part, hit, don't get me wrong. But the Black Racer? Quick aside, stupid kid me always said Dark Seed. Called him Dark Seed. So it's still kind of in my head that way. Dark side. And no, I didn't call Thanos fan nose. Anyway, what did Jack Kirby create in Dark Side and the New Gods? A very Shakespearean story and the perfect bad guy for Zack Snyder. Uax was a prince. And I'm not trying to say his name. Uax? Uax? Uxax? Uxix? I really don't know how to say that one. Dark Seed? Anyway, he was a prince. And like Anna, he was second in line. Unlike Anna, he was a murderous snake. It's coronation day! He betrayed his brother Drax. Yes, Drax, and no, not that Drax. Who in the comics was literally created to kill Thanos. Anyway, Uxus, Uxax, Uxax, Uxus. You're killing me with his name, Jack. Kill Drax when Drax tried to take control of the Omega Force. Anyway, he turned to stone and looked like Jack Palance. You are my number one guy which apparently was Kirby's real inspiration for the look of Darkseid's face. Believe it or not.
Speaking of his face, this dude literally shoots omega beams from his eyes. Beams that can either melt you or control you. Control is the key with Darkseid. Darkseid then fell in love with the sorceress. Sully? Sully? I'm so bad with these names. I've just seen them in print for years. They need to make movies about these things so I know how to pronounce it all. And they had a kid, Calabac. However, Hegra ordered Desad to poison Sully as she was corrupting Calabac. The real point here is that an already dark dark side got even darker. Sides. He was forced to marry Tigra. No, not that Tigra. And they had a son named Orion. This is where things get Shakespearean. Like the Pittsburgh Pirates always trading away their best players, Orion was traded for Scott Free. Scott was the High Father's son and heir to the throne of New Genesis, as part of a peace treaty between these two polar opposite families, that of New Genesis and that of Apocalypse. All of this made Darkseid more dark, or I should say darker, to be grammatically correct, and perfect for Zack Snyder's DC Universe. We all know that Thanos was after the Infinity Gauntlet, and that his goal was to use the stones to wipe out half of all life. What makes Darkseid different and even scarier? It's the anti-life equation. Now, it's a formula or weapon that takes away all of your free will. It takes away your life, hence anti-life. I imagine it to be like being a prisoner in your own body. You are present deep behind your own eyes, but Darkseid is in control of everything. In Justice League, I'm talking about the Snyder Cut here, Darkseid sent Steppenwolf to Earth. In the movie, they're after a mother box. Which, in the original comics, were really just smartphones. Also, in the comics, Darkseid sees the Amazons as a threat. He sees all other deities as a threat. In both comics and movie, Darkseid is on or is sending his minions to Earth because it is the location of the anti-life equation. In the movie, it's literally written on the ground. So in the comics, Darkseid wanted to probe our minds individually so he could then piece it all together. That's scary stuff. This is where Darkseid is the ultimate Snyder villain. Good or bad, Snyder's heroes are gods above us mortals. You and I, we're normal people. And when we duke it out in the comments over our love or hate for Zack Snyder, we're just normal people doing battle. In Justice League, it's gods versus gods. If you watch my video on the Eternals, you know Jack Kirby was exploring the idea that aliens created mankind. At least in those comics, I don't know what he personally believed. This all fits in really well with Snyder's universe. The little man, you, me, mostly me, we have very little control in Snyder's world. And in our own, really. I love Spider-Man more than any fictional character ever, but if he ever got this close to Darkseid, he'd be dead in an instant. I say that not as an insult to the MCU or Spider-Man, or as an insult or a compliment to Snyder's Snyderverse. However, in the Snyderverse, the stakes are at 11. These go to 11. It does go to 11, it starts at 11. And to put it simply, Justice League is scarier than the Avengers. In the Avengers, it's the idea that we, via Spider-Man or Iron Man, normal people, or as normal as normal people are in those extraordinary circumstances, can have an impact. Kid, where'd you come from? The future, Genova! Which works for the MCU, because those stories and characters are rooted in that way, for the most part. DC Comics, at least Kirby's fourth world corner of it, is about forces greater than you, or me, or Spider-Man. The problem here is, I'd rather see Zack Snyder's new gods, not Justice League. Justice League, for me, has always been about inspiring hope. It's not an S. On my world, it means hope. I don't feel that in Zack Snyder's Justice League, and frankly, Joss Whedon's attempt to make it more Avengers-like was an equally wrong decision. The one, the one and only thing Joss Whedon got right in his version was the Superman should be resurrected or not debate. In Snyder's version, there's a little bit of a dissent, but not really. They are gods worthy of this choice and they'll make the right one. In Whedon's edit, they debate that fact and get to the point, yes, we should do this. In Snyder's version, they pretty much start there. One thing that Justice League, again, Justice League here means the Snyder Cut, does well is build anticipation for Darkseid. Steppenwolf is a horrific beast of a whatever he is, but this movie actually kind of reminds me of the movie The Third Man. The whole film builds your anticipation of who Harry Lyme is, and as the film climaxes, Joseph Cotton and Orson Welles do not disappoint. For those of you not familiar with it, Orson Welles is dark side in this analogy. One example of building that anticipation comes when Wonder Woman finds the etching of Darkseid in the crypt. 
it helps hype him up. And it looks like it could have been etched by Jack Kirby himself. In Whedon's cut, Steppenwolf is the only big bad. There's no overarching bad guy beyond him. There's some vaguely hinted at things, but it's just him. And frankly, he's super lame. In Snyder's version, Steppenwolf is a big freaky monster, and he's not even the baddest dude on the block. Somewhere out there, on Apocalypse, waits Darkseid. He, like Harry Lime, looms over the movie like a shadow in the best of ways. Darkseid is like Kim Jong-il or Ung, or the dictator of your choice. Where his people, even one as powerful as Steppenwolf, fear and worship him. To be fair, he looks like he could back it up more than the Kim family could. All that to say, Darkseid is the perfect bad guy for Zack Snyder's take on Justice League. Do I love Snyder's take? No. Do I appreciate it? Yes, I do. Do I wish we got to see Justice League Part 2, where those stakes, already at an aforementioned 11, get raised exponentially? You bet your dark side I do. Stop it, Daddy.